Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Chris Ruff from Johns Hopkins University, and he's giving a talk entitled Limb Strength, Proportions, and Locomotion in Early Hominins. All right, as uh, a number of speakers have already noted, including myself in the introduction, uh, bipedalism, terrestrial bipedalism has been considered the definitive hominin trait, the thing that really sets us apart. But of course, we know that humans can still climb trees and that other primates can adopt bipedal postures like this uh, capuchin monkey who's breaking a, a nut with a stone here and doing very well at it. What makes human bipedal gait special, though, is that it's very efficient, modern human bipedal gait. So if we look at this experiment, experimental study from a few years ago, if we look at the cost of transport, that is how much it costs in terms of oxygen consumption to move a certain mass a certain distance, you find that humans are down here, walking humans. These are chimpanzees, bipedal and quadrupedal. So obviously much less efficient than humans, and in fact humans are more efficient even than your sort of average quadruped here. So very efficient. What makes it efficient? Well, lots of the things that we've been hearing about today. Uh, restructuring of the vertebral column, bring the body center of gravity over the hip joints and the lower limb and the foot. The restructuring of the pelvis for more efficient weight transfer. Changes in the foot, quite important, so we heard many times today and lengthening of the lower limb, which we haven't heard about. But uh, increasing the length of the limb that you're walking on because of our pendular mechanics of walking increases efficiency. And in fact, relative limb lengths, that is the length of the uh, forelimb to hind limb or individual bones making up the limbs, ha have long been used to categorize and uh, uh, describe locomotor differences in primates. So this slide from Schultz, you know Schultz's name showing up quite a bit today, did some of the fundamental work back uh, in the early mid-1900s in this area. And we can see this is a ratio of forelimb length to hindlimb length. We can see humans down here and then a quadrupedal primate, and then finally working our way up through the great apes and then the most arboreal, lesser apes and orangutans uh, with the highest uh, ratio of forelimb to hind limb length. So a pretty good correlation with locomotion. So of course this is something that paleoanthropologists have spent quite a bit of time studying. Uh, however, relative limb length is not necessarily as simple as would be indicated in the previous graph. It varies in a complex way in early hominins. Not all the elements of the limb change in length uh, in, in uh, tandem. You can have situations where one part of the limb is increasing in length and the other is not. Um, situations where uh, it's very hard actually to work out sort of the allometry of what's changing. Is it the hind limb getting longer or is the forelimb staying, uh, becoming relatively shorter or what, what exactly is driving these things? Uh, and there's also been some suggestions, especially recently, that relative limb length may be a, a very conserved kind of characteristic. That is, it doesn't change very quickly necessarily with a change in locomotion. So you can have primitive retentions where an animal might be completely bipedal but retain, for example, a longer upper limb or forelimb if it's not selected against. So it's actually been suggested that relative limb length is not a particularly good or very precise characteristic to evaluate locomotion with in hominids. Uh, primitive retentions or functionally significant, or, but this is really the important part, what we really want to do is distinguish between characteristics that can tell us what early hominids actually did as opposed to what they could do, okay? So relative limb length might tell you what they could do, but we're looking for traits to tell us what they actually did, and this requires a more direct evidence of use, something that's really going to reflect what they did during their lifetime as opposed to a possible primitive retention. And the characteristics that I study are structural features of long bones, the geometric distribution of bone in the cross section, which can be analyzed using an engineering model to tell us how strong those bones are. And we know from various experimental and observational studies, like this famous study of tennis players here, uh, it was carried out actually by my undergraduate advisor at Stanford. A long time ago, I had nothing to do with the study, but uh, I did look at the data later on. Um, and finding that the playing arm of tennis players, whether it's right or left side, these are professional tennis players, was some 40 to 60% stronger than the non-playing arm. And conversely, if you reduce the mechanical loading on a limb bone, it will reduce its cross-sectional strength. 
And we also know this from ontogenetic studies, which I think are very interesting natural experiments because you're, in this case, we're actually following a longitudinal sample of individuals. So each one of these points is a mean for a sample of 20 individuals that's being followed longitudinally, part of the Denver Growth Study. Uh, and this is the ratio of femoral to humeral strength, okay? And it, it's, I've compared it here to a baboon sample, which was a cross-sectional sample, wild shot baboons. And you can see that at six months to a year of age, humans have limb strength proportions identical to an adult baboon, which makes perfect sense because we're quadrupeds at that age. It's only after you begin walking that the femur increases in relative strength until it's vastly different from the baboon as an adult. So this is a natural experiment of an actual change in locomotor behavior creating a change in bone strength. Now, very recently, we've been starting a study, similar kind of study with gorillas, and I was very happy to see uh, Matt talking about uh, mountain versus lowland gorillas today, because that is actually the contrast that we're looking at. Mountain gorillas we know are less arboreal, lowland gorillas are more arboreal, and we know that they have different strength proportions, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, but we've also just recently gotten some data on young mountain gorillas who we know are actually more arboreal than their adult family members, and you find some very interesting results here. This is actually humeral versus femoral strength. Here are chimpanzees and lowland gorillas with relatively stronger upper limbs because they climb more. Mountain gorillas are significantly lower, okay? They have less strong forelimbs, but here are juvenile mountain gorillas. These are very young ones, and they look much more like lowland gorillas and chimpanzees, and we know that they climb more. So even in this close, phylogenetically close comparison, we're finding some really distinctive changes that correlate with locomotor behavior in, in bone strength. So we think these are good characteristics for determining what an animal was actually doing at that point in its life. Okay, here's the, the same hominin phylogeny, and what I'm gonna do is go through a few comparisons within this phylogeny of uh, actually uh, lower limb to upper limb, bone strength, and see whether actually we can say something about what these animals were actually doing at that, at that point in time. So the first comparison I'm gonna carry out is between some of these early homo uh, taxa. Now at this point, we're almost to the exclusively bipedal portion of the hominid uh, tree, so the question would be, are all these fellows here uh, actually bipedal? Uh, committed bipeds, or is there some variation? We have three uh, associated skeletons with skulls that we can uh, taxonomically group. Uh, homo habilis, OH62, uh, and a couple of early Homo erectus or gaster specimens, an adult, and this famous juvenile, the Nericotomy boy that you've seen several times already today. And we were able to obtain cross sections from the humerus and the femur for each of these. And if we look at femoral to humeral strength in modern humans and chimpanzees, as expected, humans have greater femoral strength relative to humeral strength than chimpanzees. There is no overlap here between the distributions. And if we add those specimens in, we find 1808, that was the adult uh, early Homo erectus, falls right within modern humans. The Nericotomy boy also right within modern humans. His slightly lower position here could actually be explained by the fact that he's an adolescent. Adolescents don't quite have the modern proportions, uh, adult proportions, but OH62 does not. Homo habilis, <laughs> I like the chuckle. Uh, Homo habilis <laughs> falls in, within the chimpanzee distribution, quite, quite obviously well below the human distribution, uh, indicating that it's different. That we have two different, to me at least, two different forms of mechanical loadings of the limbs here, strongly suggesting to me that Homo habilis whether or not it was completely modern in terms of bipedality uh, when on the ground was using the trees, was using its upper limbs in a chimp-like manner. What about Aeophorensis, the uh, taxon that Lucy belongs to? Well, we have Lucy, okay? It's so the one really associated specimen that we have that we can do this analysis on. Uh, we were not able to get cross-sections of this for a long time, but just recently with the help of uh, John Kappelman and his crew down in Texas, some CT scans actually were taken that were interpretable, and we were able to add her to the chart here. And she falls in between humans and chimpanzees, actually. So, not human-like, 
but more human light than OH62, which in itself is a very interesting observation. But my interpretation would be relatively stronger humerus, okay? And in fact, from other isolated specimens, just humeri, we know that afarensis did have an extremely strong humerus by any measure here, a huge muscle crests, et cetera. So unfortunately, we don't have associated femora, but that is certainly consistent with the evidence from these isolated bones. What about Africanus? Well, unfortunately, we don't have any associated humeri, uh, humeral femoral specimens, but we do have one specimen from Sterkfontein, 431, where we have a, a good distal half of a humerus, and we have uh, a hip bone with the acetabulum, or the hip bone side of the hip joint, which we can measure and we can use to estimate body size. We have a couple of different estimates because actually this acetabulum is slightly distorted, but um, we can get a fairly good estimate of body size that way. And then we can compare humeral strength relative to body size, which is not as good as relative to femur, but it is one measure of relative humeral strength. And this is what we come up with when we do that. First of all, okay, this is humeral strength, body mass. Here are modern humans. Here are chimpanzees. These are a couple of modern chimpanzees with known body weights, but we have others uh, with estimated body weights. You can see the chimpanzees have much stronger humeri relative to their body size than modern humans. And this Australopithecus africanus falls with chimpanzees even above chimpanzees. It has a very strong humerus relative to its body size. And so does Lucy, actually. Hey, Lucy on the same chart here. So A. africanus also had an extremely strong humerus. This is uh, Sediba. And you've seen this before. Okay, recently uh, became available and through the uh, help of Steve Churchill and uh, Chris Carlson and uh, Lee Berger, uh, I was able to look at cross sections from the humerus, humeri of these uh, two individuals. There is a femur, but the distal end of the femur here is rather worn and broken up, and so the cross sections are not completely trustworthy yet. At least they're still being worked on. But I was able to estimate body mass from the femoral heads, heads of these two individuals. One of these is a juvenile, one is an adult. And again, look at relative humeral strength, and this is where it comes out. This is very interesting given the information we just had on the foot earlier today. Uh, in fact, Sediba looks more modern than these others in terms of relative humeral strength. And I put WT15000, Nary Economy Boy on here, also just kind of for, for comparison. So the implication being that, in fact, it uh, was not loading its upper limbs in the same way as uh, these earlier Australopithecines were. How about Ramidus? Well, very interesting skeleton, obviously. Uh, people have said a few words about it today, not too much. Unfortunately, we don't have cross-section from it yet, although I assume that they will be coming. And we don't have a humerus. Okay, we have partial femoral shaft, tibia, we have forelimb bones. Um, we can look at the length of the uh, radius versus the tibia, for example, and it falls right in next to chimpanzees and not near modern humans. And I think just even looking at these comparisons here, you can see that the strength of the forearm versus the leg here is probably not going to be very human-like, <clears throat> although it will have to be quantified. And we also know from other features, such as the adducted, uh, big, to uh, abducted big toe, and the long curved digits, et cetera, that our A. ramidus has many indications of arboreality. I don't think that's really in question from anyone. So if we look at this uh, chart again, here, here's what we find. A. ramidus, significant arboreal component. A. afarensis, also evidence for significant arboreal behavior, upper limb loading. A. africanus, the same. Homo habilis, the same. Actually. And then once we get to ergaster and erectus, we have evidence for completely modern behavior. But until that point, all these forms, to my mind at least, show that there was, in addition to whatever bipedalism was practiced on the ground, we also had significantly higher loadings of the upper limb relative to the lower limb, which to me indicates that it was also being used in an arboreal context. So I think these data and other data indicate that among early hominids, terrestrial bipedality coexisted with arboreal climbing for millions of years. Terrestrial bipedality did not become obligatory until latest Australopithecus or, or Homo uh, ergaster erectus, and that adoption of terrestrial bipedality was a gradual process with many intermediate experiments. And I think that's also the message we're getting from most of the other talks today. 
And I would like to thank everyone here uh, for their work on this. Thank you.